Well, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Today is very, very special to me. We have a special guest on. Welcome, welcome. I'm sorry for the uh, technical issues. We were having some issues with the audio earlier. So um, thank you for your patience. And uh, and uh, so we have a uh, special guest, Professor Tabor, with us. And I'm very, very excited about this. Uh, just to give you a little bit of, uh, of a background, um, Professor Tabor uh, retired as a full professor from the Department of Religious Studies from uh, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where he taught Christian origins and ancient Judaism for 33 years. He retired, this was actually just this past July, um, serving as chair for a decade. Uh, Dr. Tabor previously taught at the University of Notre Dame and the College of William and Mary. Uh, Dr. Tabor has uh, combined his work on ancient uh, texts with comprehensive fieldwork in archaeology in Israel and Jordan. And since 2008, he has been a co-director with Shimon Gibson uh, of the acclaimed Mount Zion excavation in Jerusalem, and so Professor Tabor was also involved in the 1993 Waco tragedy, drawing upon his expertise in understanding ancient biblical uh, apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic excuse me, ideas, and he testified before Congress in the 1995 Waco hearings. Professor Tabor uh, has many uh, books actually available, and I'm just going to pull up a little bit uh, from his uh, academic website. Uh, you can... You can view these books. Um, I'm reading from uh, jamestabor.com, and uh, he's got some of the some of his books up here: uh, the the Jesus Dynasty, Paul and Jesus, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, the Book of Genesis, uh, Mar Marie, um, Why Waco, uh, the Jesus Discovery, uh, the Je Jesus Dynasty, a Noble Death, uh, Restoring Abrahamic Faith things un, unutterable and he's got other books as well um that he is releasing and all of these things you can find on uh, jamestabor.com as well okay so um also uh professor tabor uh has just completed a new book called the lost uh, the lost mary uh from the jewish mother of jesus to the virgin mother of god Uh, which is out in French and forthcoming in English. He is now working on two new books, Jesus Betrayed, uh, how, G how Christianity Lost Its Way and Prophecy Belief in Mega America, uh, Shifting Biblical Interpretations and Why They Matter. So over the past three decades, uh, Professor Tabor has combined his work on ancient texts with fieldwork in archaeology. He has worked at many sites in Israel and Jordan, including Qumran, the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, and several other sites as well. In, two, in uh, 2000, he teamed up with Dr. Shimon Gibson uh, to excavate a newly discovered cave at Suba, uh, west of Jerusalem, that, back, that dates back to the Iron Age, but was used for ritual rites in, early, in the early Roman period. Um, uh, Professor Tabor and Gibson were also the principals involved in the discovery of the first century Jewish burial shroud in a looted tomb at Akeldama. Uh, Professor Tabor is also a, a, public, pub, uh, a popular public lecturer and writer and is often consulted uh, by, the by the national and international media such as Time, Newsweek, U.S. News, and World Report. New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Harper's, Vanity Fair, you got AP, NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, Der Spiegel, Pro Profil, and the London Times. Professor Tabor is a regular blogger at the Huffington Post and does lectures, blog posts, and articles for the Biblical Archaeological Archaeolo Archaeology Society, excuse me. His work has been featured in dozens of uh, t TV documentaries, uh, PBS Frontline, Discovery Channel, Nightline, 2020, Learning Channel, History Channel, 
National Geographic, Smithsonian, BBC, Channel 4, UK, and ZDF. Uh, Professor Tabor has a professional blog that deals with the biblical studies and contains uh, links to his published articles. That is at jamestabor.com, as well as a popular YouTube channel called James Tabor Videos, a website that a website that uh, that archives his teaching resources for his classes and lectures, uh, the Jewish Roman world of Jesus, and a personal blog that explores uh, philosophical, aesthetic, and existential perspectives, and that is genesea.org. And you can find all of those links in the description below. So I am, we are uh, privileged and honored to have Professor Tabor with us. So I would like all of you guys in the live chat to give Professor Tabor a very, very warm welcome. Welcome, Professor Tabor. Hello, Christopher. You exhausted me there. I probably exhausted <laughs> you and your audience. So I think I've never had anybody read my whole bio. Uh, but uh, thank you. That's. Uh, I hope I can remember what I wrote, all these things that I've done. So, <laughs> But uh, we're going to talk about Paul, which is good, because that's really what I have specialized in. My dissertation was on Paul at the University of Chicago. Uh, that's where my doctorate PhD comes from. And uh, recently, the Paul and Jesus book, and then Paul's Ascent to Paradise. So I actually have three books on Paul, numerous articles. And so uh, really good to be with you. I like your name. Wow. It's a nice combination of uh, uh, Kanak, Enoch, and uh, <laughs> Christopher, which goes back to Christos. So you're kind of a combo yourself in terms of uh, those two names. So. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Tabor. It's an honor to have you with us. Um, just in the live chat quickly here, Cat Cool, uh, Matthew says Shalom. Calamento says Shalom. Psalm 94, Shalom. Tammy, I believe Tammy was probably praying for the... Uh, uh, the technical issues we were having earlier. So that's, she says, thank you, Abba. You are so good. All right. And uh, Calamento says, uh, Shalom, Professor James Tabor. Uh, Tammy Great. says, welcome, welcome, welcome. So happy to see you here. Thank you for being with us. You are my favorite professor. Well, okay. there you go. And I have a new book. <laughs> it's not even on the website. Why? Because it came out Wednesday. So I have that translation of Genesis. Bart Ehrman, by the way, is featuring it today in his blog. So if any of people follow, and anybody can read it, you don't have to join his blog. Many of your people probably know Bart Ehrman, the famous New Testament scholar. And so the book of Genesis is my own translation. I've worked on it for over a decade. If you're interested in the Hebrew Bible, which I think many of your people are, you're going to find that translation is like no other. More than Fox, Alter, Friedman, it's, uh, I think, more literal. And the reason it's called transparent is it allows you to peer through the Hebrew. And if you know Hebrew or even are working on learning Hebrew, it's even more helpful because English translations obscure generally the original text rather than reveal it. And so this, everybody said, well, do you have anything besides Genesis? So I went and pulled the things I was willing to put out. And this is uh, about 80 pages of everything from the Tanakh. So the Torah, the, the uh, Nevi'im, the prophets and the writings. Um, and I'm thinking some of your listeners are for those terms. The Hebrew Bible, in other words. Yes. So yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Sorry for those uh, tech details, but I think we're okay. I think we're okay. All right. So um, just before we dive into Paul, I remember, I think it was, uh, I think it was Tammy, actually, one of my uh, listeners here asked, uh, specifically asked, um, when you come on, would it be possible just to quickly give a little bit of an, uh, an overview of, of your uh, involvement with the Waco tragedy? Sure. Uh, of course, there's a book, Why Waco? So I'd always point you to the book. But if you go to the website, jamestaver.com, and look at some of the articles and materials, there's some Waco material there. 
And my YouTube channel has quite a bit on Waco. It's actually one of the categories. And we're coming up on the 30th anniversary. Essentially, my involvement was working with Dr. Philip Arnold, who uh, is from Rice University. And he and I began to realize within the first week of uh, the siege, this was 1993, so some of your listeners weren't born, but uh, 30 years ago this coming uh, February, on February 28th, and then there was a 51-day siege. Now, those of us who can remember, who are old enough to remember, if you are above the age of five or maybe up to 10 or 12, you would know that it captured the country. Uh, Bill Clinton was president. Janet Reno had just gotten in as attorney general. And it was, uh, remember back then we had nightly news, the three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS. I don't, I can't, I don't even think, yeah, CNN existed, I think, but uh, the others didn't. And so literally you'd turn your, your, TV on and listen, and they would, Waco was just constantly discussed, like, well, what's happening today? This is day 38, or this is day 40, or whatever. And Arnold and I realized very early on that they were not understanding that this is an apocalyptic group, like, like them, or lump them, or whatever you think about them. If you want to save lives, you have to work into their worldview. So our whole purpose was to try to provide the FBI with some understanding of how an apocalyptic bru uh, views the outside. Unfortunately, they were delivering to David Koresh and his, his students, he called them his students. Uh, they were delivering to them the very thing that uh, would make it worse, meaning a kind of version of the apocalypse. And it ended in tragedy and but we did uh, almost succeed. We got materials into David. He named us and said he would love to, to come out and meet with Dr. Tabor and Dr. Arnold. And it, it's sort of like one of those what could have been situations. Since then, uh, several of us have met with the FBI now for the past 30 years. And they've completely revamped their understanding of how to deal with a religious group. Uh, and to take into consideration their worldview rather than just saying, oh, this is a crazy cult. They're not going to surrender. They're not sincere. They're all kind of brainwashed. And so, but on my YouTube channel, James Tabor videos, go down to Waco and there's a three hour discussion between four of us that were mostly involved. And it's basically, gonna, you don't even have to buy the book. If you want to buy the book, that's great. But it's basically uh, an analysis of everything that went wrong at Waco. So, wow, amazing! I remember, I remember Waco back in those days. I was a teenager at that time, and yeah, I remember. Um, I wasn't following it very, like, like really close, but I do remember that. Sure. Yeah, well, anyone who was alive remembers the fire, and that was the horror of it all, and how that happened and what happened and would take us way beyond uh, but but the key is to understand how a group that thinks they have a living prophet uh, they come from the Adventist tradition and they believe that David was the final angel the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation that would bring the final message to the world and so this was their worldview and it doesn't mean you have to agree with it. When we spoke with David, we never told him we agreed at all. But we would discuss his views intelligently, and we got his trust. Uh, basically, it came down to negotiators, which I see as positive. They want to accommodate and understand and make positive effort and tactical people. Anybody remember the Randy Weaver case? It was the same group of FBI agents that uh, turned that into a horrible tragedy with Randy's wife and baby shot and all kinds of horrors. Uh, so, you know, I don't think it'll happen again, thankfully, but uh, in the nineties, we just weren't ready for dealing with this kind of thing. I think more is coming because we're in an apocalyptic time 
you know, whether you think the end is near, you don't even believe in the end. Uh, so many things are happening in the world and even climate change and other things that are going to cause people more and more to uh, wonder if this could be the end. And you'll have groups popping up, as we already have, that are uh, taking this or that view of apocalyptic. And that's not irrelevant to Paul, if you agree with my perspective, at least, that Paul also thought that he would live to see the end. Yeah, and so, so one of the ways of understanding Paul is not just to slam him and say, well, wasn't he wrong? You know, the world went on for 2,000 years. But understand how that affects, that sort of belief affects people in their decisions about ethics, about how they're going to conduct, in his case, his preaching. He didn't think he had much time. He talks about the appointed time has grown very short and so forth. So anyway, that's uh, glad to be asked about it. Plenty of resources uh, that can be uh, accessed. Tammy says Waco was horrible, so sad, and it definitely could have went way different. She also said, I watched the whole interview with the four of your group. Well, Tammy is up to date then, because uh, <laughs> good for you, Tammy. You know how YouTube is. They say, if you go over an hour, no, if no, you go over 15 minutes, nobody will listen. You know what my attitude to that is? Probably didn't want those people anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, and you would like us to go way over an hour here, and we'll try to, we had to start late, but lost 20 minutes. But uh, I'm interested in uh, deep dives, you know, serious people that have spent years and years and years studying maybe even biblical languages and translations and Hebrew Bible, New Testament, church history, Judaism in antiquity, who want to uh, hear the benefit of what I've learned over the years. So I'm very, very pleased to have uh, what I take to be your audience, which I think uh, is going to tend to be what I call deep divers into this material. I think we fit right into that. So, um, so Paul, um, and we have different ideas of where I hear different ideas of where he came, like where he actually came from. Where do you like, where do you think he was born? And like, like where, where, where is he actually from? I, I try to show in my book, even though the book of Acts has him making a speech at one point where he does say he was born in Tarsus. Um, I'm not sure the author of Acts, we can refer to him as Luke, I guess, but that's the tradition. Uh, I personally am not sure about the author of Acts, but uh, be that as it may, I think there's a good indication that in the year Herod the Great died, 4 BC, traditionally, some people say 3, some people say 5 or 6, but I'm going to go with the kind of standard chronology of 4 BC. We have traditions from Jerome. Now, Jerome is a 4th and 5th century Christian writer, but he lives in the Holy Land, and he has access, like Eusebius did as well, to the libraries in the Holy Land of the Holy Land has become, in the Byzantine period, Christianized after Constantine. And he finds the evidence uh, that he puts forth. And, you know, he's not one to want to contradict Acts because he's real conservative. He's a, you know, Roman Catholic uh, priest and so forth. Very pious, very dedicated. And he says that Paul was born in the Galilee in Gishala. You can look it up. You're not probably have trouble finding it on maps. It's a little village in the north. I've been there. It's called Gish today, G-I-S-H. So if you looked on a map, like if you went to Google Maps, you could type in, or any map program, you could type in Gish uh, in the land of Israel and you, you would find it. And he says that when the revolt broke out, and we know this from the historian Josephus, all hell broke loose. I call it the year of the three messiahs. And we have real good evidence in my Mary book, which will be out next year. It's out in French, but not in English yet. We held it up because of COVID and various reasons. 
But in my Mary book, I talk, I have a chapter called The Year of the Three Messiahs. And what happened was, I bet a lot of your people have heard of Judas the Galilean. Uh, he kind of popped up. And then Simon of Perea, and then the one who's called the Shepherd King. We have three uh, would-be Messianic people all kind of coming and leading revolts. They tend to be centered in the Galilee. And so the Romans sent down a couple of legions from Syria. That's where the Roman troops were actually stationed on the eastern frontier. And they put down the revolt very brutally and exiled lots of the population of the Galilee. So people were killed. Uh, Josephus mentions 2,000 crucifixions, which is just extraordinary to think about. Now, if we go with 5 BCE for the birth of Jesus, I would say Paul probably very likely is also born around that time. So Paul and Jesus would be the same age. Jesus dies much earlier than Paul, a couple decades earlier. Paul may be in the 60s. Jesus may be Traditionally, we say 30. These are working dates. People disagree and agree. But I, I generally use them, you know, in my books to try to be mainstream with what people have generally concluded. And what, what Jerome is referring to is uh, pe populations being exiled as a punishment for the rebellion. It wouldn't mean that Paul's family was personally involved in the revolt, uh, but that they were sent to Tarsus. And so that's a tradition that Jerome passes on. And I think it makes some sense. And whether we can know the details, like what if his mother was pregnant and got exiled and then was actually born in Tarsus? You know, maybe we don't have that kind of a handle on what actually happened. But it still puts him back at that time. Mary probably would have been about 14 or 15, just judging by age of marriage. And she's a young woman uh, who's been betrothed to Joseph, uh, who becomes her husband later. So that would indicate that uh, they were not exiled and they were living in a little village south of Sepphoris. And we could talk about Sepphoris at some point. It belongs more with the study of Jesus, but I've excavated there. Sepphoris was the urban center of all Galilee. And Herod Antipas, this is the son of Herod the Great, had his palace there. But the Romans came in when Herod the Great died in 4 BC, and they leveled it. They burned it to the ground because Judas the Galilean had broken into the armory there, and that's how he had armed his revolt. Basically, what happens is what happens to all messiahs uh, in this period. The Romans come in with massive force, and they wiped them out. So Simon was beheaded, Judas was crucified, and I forget the shepherd king, how he was killed, but it was a violent death. And they literally just put down the revolt with tremendous force. Uh, Herod had been reigning since about 31 BC. He had the favor of the emperor. And now his son, Herod Antipas, took over live in the Galilee. So Jesus grew up under Herod Antipas, uh, but his family was not exiled, or we would probably certainly hear of that, and maybe just laid low. I mean, if you stayed in your house and didn't do anything, and they're right there where the main focus of the battle is, uh, you would not necessarily be exiled. But up in Gish or Gishala, where Paul's family lived, that was a hotbed of the revolt. And so uh, they probably just exiled the whole city. So that's more his background. He then, we think, he never says this in his letters. So one of the problems you have, and if you get my book, Jesus and Paul, I have an appendix in the back in which I try to give you a method. It's just a working method. It's not perfect. How do you sort out what Paul says in his early letters? And many scholars would say his genuine letters. And then, so primary Paul, let's call it primary Paul. There's seven of them. It would be first and second Corinthians, Galatians, Philemon, Philippians, Romans. Is that seven? I might have forgotten one of them. I think that's, oh, first Thessalonians. Yeah. 
let's call that primary pull. Then there's secondary pull that has various levels, Colossians, Ephesians, and so forth. Finally, the so-called pastorals, Timothy, first and second, Timothy, Titus. So I, I try to talk about the, the tiers of Paul. So you've got the primary letters, the secondary letters, and then the account of Acts. And if you want to add another one, you could say later traditions, and then you would come up with Jerome and other things. And I privilege, of course, as you would expect, the early material. So my method in the book, because I want to be clean about the method, you know, often scholars are accused of just picking and choosing what they like. They go, well, why does he accept that verse in the Gospels? And he says something else is later. Or this is an interpolation or something like that. So I want to be very clean in my method. So in the book, I say I'm only going to use a primary poll to establish his views. And that's what I'll do today. Doesn't mean the others are worthless by any means, but you have to sort of set up a method for deciding. So the idea that Paul is a Roman citizen and a tent maker, which really means a leather worker uh, in Greek, and we know a lot about that. He's an itinerant person who could get a job traveling through the Mediterranean world as a leather worker. They make tents for the Roman army mostly. You say, well, who would need tents? You know, this is not campers in the national park or anything like that. This would be for the Roman army. And uh, that means that he deals with hides and leather and so forth. It's not considered a really high job for an Orthodox uh, Jew. Do you remember in the book of Acts, there's Simon the Tanner that's mentioned. He's yeah. kind of seen if you deal, I mean, somebody has got to do it, so to speak, uh, you know, make leather, make parchments, even the Dead Sea Scrolls are written on leather. They, something has to be done to animal skins. So he is involved in that. And probably from his father, that would be typical of a Jewish boy growing up. You would learn the trade of your father. And the Mishnah does say, if you don't teach your son a trade, even if he's a brilliant scholar and is the highest student in the whole academy, which we think, according to Paul, he was. He said, I exceeded, and he says this in the primary letters, I exceeded all of my contemporaries in my, in my advancement in Judaism. So is that just bragging or egotistical? I'm going to, you know, hey, it's in the primary letter. At least we can say whether he exaggerated or not. He claimed that. And so, but Acts is the one that says he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. So you see the point? But you can then take what he says that I advance beyond any of my contemporaries. And Acts says he studied at the feet of the rabbi Gamaliel II, who would have been the rabbi at the time. And then we would have to decide, uh, well, maybe the Gamaliel thing could be accepted since it has correlation in the primary letters. Not the name of the rabbi, but, you know, at least uh, that kind of idea that he studied Judaism. So what I do, and it's in an appendix to the book, Paul and Jesus. I think it's also on my blog, uh, and I believe it's various places on the Internet has to do with sorting out the sources for Paul. And that's the method I use for my books. I, I go with primary Paul. So you can ask me about secondary Paul, but I think many times some of the topics that you would be interested in, if you accept the secondary letters and the book of Acts, you're going to come out differently with some of your conclusions. And so I always think it's good to get the core right kind of the undisputed Paul, some of your most skeptical uh, mythicists that don't even think Jesus existed. Most of them are quite sure Paul existed. And generally, I think you've had Robert Price on. I don't know if he had Richard yes. Carey or whatever, but generally they would say, yeah, the letters do seem to come across as, you know, good first person documents. Maybe they've been interpolated a little bit, uh, but they ring true to me. Uh, I've got my Greek New Testament here. I'll wave it for you just because, uh, not to brag here, but you notice I had to put tape on the back. I've read, to write my book on Paul, I read the seven letters of Paul in Greek. You know, I don't want to exaggerate, but I would say 25, 30 times at least, you know, reading through, making notes on all the vocabulary and so forth. So I wanted to really focus in on what we call early Paul, if you want to call it authentic, Paul, 
I prefer the word primary poll, and then you can have secondary poll and bring it in if you need to. But secondary poll shouldn't disagree with primary poll, generally speaking. So you see how there's a method to the, the layers that I present. So uh, you believe that Paul was born in Gish? Gishela or Gish, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quote, I'm just accepting the Jerome account, and uh, Paul never says where he was born, but he does say he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was of the Pharisaic sect that he advanced in Judaism. And my guess would be that he does go to Jerusalem as a star student, sent likely by his parents to study uh, what we would call rabbinics. Uh, at the time, and we know some of the rabbis from the Mishnah and the Tosefta. These are the earliest Jewish texts that we have. Hillel would be one of the main ones, Gamaliel, uh, and uh, these are actually bef before Paul would have been there as a, in a later period. And uh, Shammai is another one that's mentioned, and quite a few others. We know quite a bit about the first century Pharisees in what you would call the academy, the rabbinic academy of the Pharisees. And not as much as we want, but uh, Josephus claimed to be part of that group as well. So he can be called upon as a first century source to help supplement some of the things that he writes. Uh, so you said that Gish is still there in Israel? Yeah, it's a little town. Um, they, when you drive in, you'll see restaurants that remember Paul was from there and different uh, kind of local memory. I'm not claiming it goes back to the first century, but there, there is a tradition that he was born in Gish. Now, since he says I was born in Tarsus and X, most people never even look at that. They go, oh, that's later legend. But I think it's very possible. It would fit the idea of why somebody would get exile from the land of Israel and be taken to Asia Minor, the city of Tarsus, you know, why would that have happened? So that he's a Jew of the diaspora, yes, but he has family roots and so forth in Jerusalem. And so the book of Acts can be useful in that way, I think. And how do you spell, I looked, I tried to look up Gish in Israel and it would I be G-I-S-H, but uh, if you don't find that, uh, it could be that it's you might have to look on uh, a web browser to try to find it. But I, I come up with there's J I S H. Would that be it? That could be. Yeah, that's oh, that it. That's be. just uh, what happens when you go from Arabic to Hebrew to English. The J, the G. Yeah, G. That would be it right there. You can, if you found G, that's it. Okay. With the J. Mm -hmm. So he was born in Gish, Gish or G? Gish, whatever you want to say. Okay, and, and he was exiled to Tarsus. Yeah, because of uh, the revolt when they emptied out the north of the country. And lots of people from the south then moved up. And that had also been happening even in the, uh, in the Maccabean period under the Maccabean rulers uh, going all the way back. Uh, so, uh, and we know a lot of that from archaeology. Several villages in the Galilee have been excavated now uh, very successfully. And uh, some of them have synagogues and they have first century remains even, including Nazareth. Uh, synagogue hasn't been found there, but Magdal, Gamala, and so forth. And these were all basically abandoned or destroyed in the period of 4 BC. People were taken out of those places and uh, there was a punishment for anybody the Romans thought had participated in the revolt. I might add what the Romans are really concerned about, obviously revolt is not a good thing in the Galilee. Uh, and you've got Judea that in 6 CE is going to be put under direct Roman rule. And that includes Jerusalem, so-called procurators. And Archelaus, who's the brother of Herod Antipas, he only rules from 4 BC to 6 BC, and then he's taken out by the emperor. 
uh, for various reasons. You can read Josephus about that. And what they're worried about is the Parthians. This is what people forget. They're really worried about the Parthians because before Herod the Great pacified the country, there was a Maccabean ruler. His name is Antigonus. And again, you can look him up in Josephus. And he's the last of the Maccabeans. And he set himself up as priest and king in Jerusalem and invited the Parthians and the Persians from the east into Jerusalem. They actually came in and supported him. And the main obstacle then of Herod, of Herod uh, the Great, he was just a young man at that point in his 20s, I think, was to free Jerusalem and then give it back into Roman rule. So he had done that successfully and really, quote, pacified the whole country under Roman rule during Herod's long reign of, uh, what, 40 years. He, like King David, he ruled 40 years. His problem was his pedigree. He wasn't even Jewish by birth. His mother was Arabian and his father was Idumean. And even though the father converted and was loyal to the Romans, to Jews, because of the Torah, you may not set a stranger over you as king. The book of Deuteronomy says that. Pious Jews would say, you can put these people anywhere you want, but they're not, they can never be king. And several of the Maccabeans declared themselves as priest and king. They were a priestly tribe. We know that. But to add the word king is very bold and it conflicts with Caesar because Augustus is now in charge from about the same time. And as you know, from the new Testament, there's no King, but Caesar and to claim to be a King then is, is uh, punishable by death. And that's actually what Jesus got Jesus killed. Even if he had a different understanding of kingship, if we go by several of our gospel accounts, he, uh, in one account, when he's asked, are you a king? He says, well, you say I am. But in another account, Mark, our earliest, he says, I am. I am a king. And you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. So he makes this right in your face apocalyptic statement that he's a king. And that would be taken by certainly Pontius Pilate, whom he is examining him at that point, as definitely uh, enough to have him crucified. And uh, of course the gospels blame some of the Jewish leadership and I'm sure they were involved. And Pilate is kind of given a whitewash as if he, he would have never done something like that. But if you know Pilate from Josephus, he's one of the cruelest procurators. He did horrible things and he definitely did not m mind slaughtering Jews by the thousands all the time, you know, if they got out of. So the Romans are concerned with that stability. Paul's in Jerusalem at that time. From all that we can recover, he said, I grew up in Jerusalem and so forth. So he's in Jerusalem. And uh, now he's not old enough to go back to the revolt. As I said, he would be just a baby, I think, at that point. And especially if he was exiled, his birth would have been around 4 BC. So same age as Jesus. There's a term in Greek, uh, uh, basically means a young man, and that would be somebody under the age of 30, from 20 to 30, basically. And Paul is called a young man in the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, again, see how I'm using Acts in a selective way. But it's not as though you just throw Acts out and don't get anything from it, because uh, the author of Acts has put together certain things and gathered information and I would hate to do without Acts. I, I read it often and try to take into consideration uh, what it means in terms of a Hellenistic uh, uh, kind of like biography of Paul, which it ends up being by chapter nine or so. It just is basically mostly Paul. But it has a lot of theology to it that you have to consider. I don't think the theology of the book of Acts is the theology of Paul and his primitive letters or his primary letters. There's a lot of differences. 
I would say that the theology of Mark is very close to Paul, almost on every point. And I also cover that in the book, Paul and Jesus. If you want to study my books on Paul, um, one of them's out of print, Things Unutterable. But I, that was my dissertation. But I bought, brought out a version of it, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, that you can now get on Amazon. And uh, it's not thoroughly revised, but it's more of a real academic book. But Paul and Jesus is written for the general public. And in that, chap in that book, I have a chapter called Reading the Gospels Backward or Reading the New Testament Backwards. And what I argue there is don't start with the Gospels. Like everybody wants to read the New Testament. They start with Matthew. Uh, you're really late if you do that. You need to. And then they try to harmonize it as they go through. You know, Matthew has appearances of Jesus at the empty tomb. He has one with Mary Magdalene. And Luke, of course, has a bunch. And John has even more. And But Mark doesn't have any of those. So. It's better to go with Mark, and uh, if we get into it, we'll talk about Paul's view of resurrection. I have a whole chapter on that. But Paul and Jesus is easy to read. It's a page turner. If your people are clearly interested in this stuff, so I think when I say it's a page turner, probably some people would be thoroughly bored with it, but I would like to make the statement, Christopher, to you and all of your viewers today and future, Paul is the most influential person in Western history. And I know that's going to normally go to Jesus or Moses or whoever, but it's definitely Paul. And the reason is people are getting their Jesus primarily through Paul. And of course we have the gospels, but the theology as it's influenced the church so much, particularly the Gentile church is primarily Paul. And I think you need to start with that and understand. And Mark, rather, being an, rather than being an interpreter of Peter, which is what later church fathers try to say, and that he lives in Rome and so forth, uh, I'm pretty sure Mark, and I've worked a lot on Mark. Um, in fact, I have a course uh, with Derek Lambert that we filmed the other day. It's a seven-part course on the Gospel of Mark. And I point out in that course, uh, it's going to be on YouTube. No, actually, I think it's just going to be streamed. You can sign up for it. But uh, that'll be in the fall. You'll hear about it. And I'll advertise it and let the word out. By the way, I have an email list. If you go to jamestaver.com, you can sign up and be on my email list. And, I, and if you go on down, if you're on a laptop, it's like on the side, if you're on a uh, mobile device like a phone it's at the bottom you know how they do the page but you can sign up no obligation never I never use your emails for anything but that I've, I've got probably 14,000 emails I do not ever give them away and uh, so anybody I welcome you to sign up there keep up with things but anyway uh, I, I think we start with Paul his letters and then we can the Gospel of Mark can then fit in as a way of casting the story of Jesus, probably as Paul would uh, largely agree with it. So that's my my case that I make in the book. Before we get deeper into the um, theology of Paul, I want to ask you about your about Paul and the Torah. But just before that, um, do you believe that Paul was actually because I know there are different people to say, yeah, it says it, but I, I don't believe it. But do you believe that Paul was actually brought up at the feet of Gamaliel? I see no particular reason to doubt that. It's supplementary to what he says in his own letters. Now, he could be a braggart and be exaggerating, but you don't, in that period of the 40s and 50s growing up, you don't exceed everybody in your Pharisaic circles if you're not working with the main rabbi of the time, and that would be Gamaliel. So yeah, I would. Uh, I don't. I don't see any big problem with that. But I'm not going to make much of it, you know. Other than Paul is familiar with uh, rabbinic arguments, and 
his understanding of the Torah. Lots of people have written about this. I, I think he is pretty much who he says he is, but whether you uh, accept his applications and interpretation, clearly that's not the way the Pharisees went. And also the Pharisees are about as far from a messianic apocalyptic group as you can get as far as we know from what survives, which would be mainly Josephus and the Mishnah and Tosefta. So. But I, I don't have a problem with him saying uh, that he was brought up with Gamaliel. It essentially is saying that he's a Pharisee. He says, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. These are some of, you can take his bio, bi, uh, biographical statements in his letters, and I do that in the book, Paul and Jesus, and I begin to tally them and show you where they differ and so forth. I finally give you a list at the end. You can say this, this is two sources here, three sources. This is agreed by everybody, and that's helpful to try to see uh, what you want to finally go with. But I don't have any huge objection to that. One of the things that some people would say, and I'd just like to get your input on this, and that is that, um, for example, like Gamaliel in, in Acts chapter 5 says, that basically leave the Christians alone. I mean, just. Mm. Yeah. And, and then we have Paul that doesn't do that, right? Does the opposite. Mm. Um, what would you say to that? That's just getting into the question of how we would want to use Acts. And I would certainly go with Paul first. And uh, he does talk about, I persecuted the church of God. He says, I'm not worthy to even be called an apostle. Uh, he's very modest, but you've got to know Paul's personality. He can be modest and egotistical at the same time. I don't mean egotistical in a bad sense, like he's some narcissist or something. Maybe he is, but just that he can talk about how great he is and also how humble he is at the same time. So he can't resist saying when he tells you about, I'm nothing, I'm the least. Then he'll say, but I worked harder than them all. You know, like, okay. And then he goes, I'm last, but not, and I'm the least, but... Uh, I was chosen before birth. And I don't know that we have any indication or record that any of the other apostles, you know, when in the book of Acts, when they talk about how they're chosen, they start with John the baptizer, remember? They say, we're going to replace uh, Judas. And they end up having two candidates. But the qualifications are they need to be with the movement from John on. I think it's very important. And so that's kind of my understanding as well. And in that sense, um, I would say Paul probably is making a claim to a divinely ordained birth. I don't mean virgin birth or anything like that, his mother. That uh, as far as we know, Je Jeremiah is told that in Jeremiah chapter 1, while you were in the womb, I knew you. And I do argue in my... Paul and Jesus book, and also my major academic book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. I argue that he reads himself into Isaiah 49, which is one of the four suffering servant hymns. As he thinks that all of them apply to Jesus on one level, but I think he also feels that his mission is Isaiah 49. You know, there's, there's a real dynamic here that I argue that he sees himself in scripture. And if you look at Isaiah 49, I was called from my mother's womb and he's been sent to his own people. But he also says there's a voice that tells him if you read Isaiah 49, it's the voice of Hashem or God. Oh, well. You think it's uh, a lot that I'm sending you to Israel. I'm also sending you to the Gentiles, the nations. And I think that's where he begins to. Now, I think he had visions, revelations. He heard voices. He has many things that he calls, his, he calls them revelations. And that's what the book is about. Paul's ascent to paradise in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says, I had an abundance of these revelations and he talks about talking to jesus first person you know i asked the lord three times he answered me and said this 
And so he does believe that he, although last is not least, and is prophesied to do what he is doing. This would hook, I know you mentioned you've had Jason Staples on, and this would hook in with what Jason uh, has begun to put forth from his dissertation and now in his two books, one of them, I don't sure if they're both out, one's out, the book on, I've got it here, The Idea of Israel, but then he's got the other book that covers Romans 9 through 11, and he argues that uh, this is a way of uh, regathering some sort of restored Israel by going to the Gentiles. And I remember Bart years ago told me what Jason was working on. And I, I was sort of leaning to that view anyway. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I think I'm getting convinced, you know, by my own student. And I've heard him more recently say since Jason has published his books that I think Jason's right. And his books are so important because people just throw around Israel and lost tribes and all of these things, you know, so loosely. And what Jason says is, wait a minute, we got to talk about what text are you reading? When were they written? By whom were they written? What is their outlook? What is their presupposition? And then you can begin to understand what might be going on in a given text. So uh, I think he's really, really made major contributions and he knows, I think, that uh, I haven't started interviewing people yet. I just retired, and I'm trying to get everything ready to really launch my YouTube channel even more. It, it's really doing well, but I've put up a lot of old stuff from 10, 15 years ago that people are perfectly happy to, to view. But I want to have Jason on and maybe do two or three shows with him, like, you know, the way you did. So I think he's really an important scholar. And I love his work, and I really appreciate it. So plug for Jason Staples. All right. Yeah, it was a privilege having him on. Uh, when you're talking about Paul there earlier, saying that he kind of seems like he kind of, I know you didn't say it this way, but it's like it seems like he kind of contradicts himself in a way, like I am the least of all the apostles. It reminds me like how he said, I'm the least of all the apostles, but then in, a different, in, in another spot, it's like I'm not, the least inferior <laughs> that's right <laughs> to the and he apostles. if you read every time he begins talking about that sort of thing putting himself down he always counters it like by saying but i la labored harder than them all you got that and then yeah. of course you're referring i think to first corinthians 9 where he says yeah i have the right to do this and that and the lord's brother james uh, he doesn't name him but says the Lord's brothers and Peter, they do this and that. I have the perfect right to do that. I'm not inferior as an apostle. So we call him the 13th apostle. Now the challenge is to know whether the 12 and James, who's the leader of the 12 at this point, are, would they affirm that? Or would they, in other words, in Acts, we got a lot of harmonizing Acts 15, Acts 21, although Acts 21 does hint that maybe it's not so clear, because in Acts 21, James says, you know, we've heard that you're teaching Jews not to keep the Torah. And, uh, of course, we've agreed that Gentiles do not have to, quote, keep the Torah. By that means convert to Judaism, circumcision for the males, take on the full obligations of the what later become the 613 commandments of Judaism. You know, we don't have that number in the ancient world, but just the idea of the whole, the whole yoke of the Torah. And so in Acts 21, James doesn't let him answer. He says, but I know you're not doing that, Paul. And in order to prove that you're not doing that, we've got these men that are finishing up a Nazirite, not a Nazareth, but a Nazirite vow from the book of Numbers. And uh, would you go in the temple with them and pay for their uh, expenses and just show up there and everybody will see you're in the temple? And, well, I heard he might be turning from the Torah, but he, he's there absolutely affirming something like the Nazarite vow and how it's supposed to be performed, which involves animal sacrifices and so forth. 
And according to Acts, Paul goes, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And that's when he gets arrested, of course, because he has other people that are his enemies that want to stop him. Uh, he, of course, never refers to that. But he does say in Galatians 1 that he got from James and Peter and John, who he calls the so-called pillars of the church. And then he, he can't resist adding, what they are means nothing to me. And again, I take that in context. It doesn't mean he hates them or is repudiating them because he says they were, quote, in Christ before me. But he says they gave me the right hand of fellowship. And they agreed that I can go teach Gentiles and they would be under, which is essentially what the rabbis call the Noahide laws, the laws of Noah that apply universally to all humankind. And generally Romans and Greeks would agree with maybe 80% of them, but the big stickler could be defining fornication or sexual immorality, porneia in Greek, what does that involve? For example, there's forbidden degrees of marriage. You can't marry your father's wife, 1 Corinthians 5. Even if your father is dead, uh, you know, and she would be free to marry. You cannot do that. Why? Because the Torah says that that's uh, sexual immorality. So in Acts 15, and I think Paul tends to go with this, eating blood committing fornication by a Jewish definition of sexual mores and anything to do with idolatry. Now, meat offered to idols is a touchy one because in some of his letters, he seems to indicate, actually in 1 Corinthians, he has two positions. And we think that what he begins to say as he begins in chapter 10 is interpolated with what he later says. People put these letters together, sometimes they're fragments. But he tends to want to go what we would call liberal with it, like an idol's nothing. Uh, let's say you go to the meat market, buy your meat, and don't ask, uh, where did this come from? Just, you know, buy it, it's up to you. But if somebody says, uh, did you know that was offered we're in Corinth. So did you know that was offered at the Athena temple this morning and they brought down what was left of the sacrifice and you just bought something that was dedicated to Athena? Well, you should then go, oh, really? I didn't I, I didn't realize that. Well, where can I get uh, where could I get meat that uh, isn't that way? And then, there, of course, they're vegetarian people, Romans 14, who don't even eat meat at all. And that could be one of the reasons that they don't want to just, they don't even want to touch the idea of blood. And uh, Paul says everybody just has to figure that out themselves. So he is, um, I think he tries to uphold what rabbis today call the Noahide laws, the laws of Noah, which are just like a fundamental but but I, uh, forbidding idolatry is obviously not forbidden in the Greco-Roman world. In fact, that's a real problem, that you're not participating in the culture. So when Paul gets his converts to leave their Hellenistic, Roman, Greek culture, religiously, socially, culturally, it's a huge step for them. They won't be able to maybe participate anymore in festivities that all centered around civic holidays and the celebration of gods, seasonal kinds of things. Kind of like some very conservative Christians, especially if they're kind of Hebrew oriented, they won't keep Christmas or Easter or Halloween or anything like that because they see those as pagan. So clearly you had... Uh, people in Paul's time that were very strict on these things, and certainly some of the more observant Jews would not participate in those things. But we also have Paul wanting to give freedom. So he apparently gave them this slogan, all things are lawful. We think that's a slogan. It comes up in 1 Corinthians, uh, that letter, so important. And then he says, well, technically that's true. An idol is nothing. 
does it really matter if the meat was offered to an idol? I mean, why would that matter? Uh, but he says, if, if somebody objects, as we already said, then you need to care about your brother more than, uh, but he also says, uh, at one point in that double tradition of first Corinthians, he talks about, uh, don't go to an idol's temple. So first he said, you know, you could, if you know what you're doing. Maybe it's a celebration that really doesn't involve the worship. You know, let's say somebody went to a Christmas thing today. He said, look, I don't believe in Jesus born at Christmas, and I don't believe in a lot of the Roman Catholic and Protestant views of Christmas. And I know it was a pagan holiday, but, you know, my kids are in a play or whatever. And, you know, all the kids are going to be together. And, of course, Jehovah Witness kids aren't going to do that. And uh, Worldwide Church of God kids aren't going to do that. And a lot of Hebrew Roots people won't do that. So we've all actually got things like this today that aren't exactly equivalent. Because I'm not going to accuse some poor second grade teacher who puts on a Christmas play that could have been like Frosty the Snowman or something as, you know, worshiping old St. Nick or, but uh, it, it's very similar, I think. And if you follow the strict way of a, a more orthodox or observant Judaism, you will segregate yourself from many, many things of that nature. And of course that's disruptive to families. It's disruptive to social events. Now, if you're Jewish, you have an advantage because the Romans have made treaties with the Jews, including in the diaspora all around the Mediterranean world, that they don't have to serve in the army and they don't have to swear allegiance to Caesar and they don't have to undergo certain civic obligations. They're not required to hold office and so forth. And if they volunteer, I think there are ways they could do that because we do know some Jews who are in the Roman army. But... Uh, they're given this freedom. Well, what if you're a Gentile that's now turned to the one God of Israel? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, you've turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Okay, that's a huge step. And to wait for his son from heaven, Jesus, who delivers us from the apocalyptic wrath to come. So that's his definition of what he's doing. Well, how are those people then going to fit into the culture? And with uh, in First Corinthians, that's our lab because he tries it all. And also Galatians, where people are going too far this way, too far that way. People are disagreeing. People are damning each other because their views are different. Romans 14 is also important for that. There he covers some of those social issues. So it's tough uh, in the first century to follow the Jesus movement, even with Paul, because you're going to get segregated from certain things. But he does want to allow them a leeway and a measure of freedom, but certainly not in anything that he would be considered, uh, would be considered sexual immorality. He makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. Can't go to prostitutes. You know, you say, well, that wouldn't, that'd be okay. You're not married and you're free. Why couldn't you do that? And uh, he says, absolutely not. Can't do that. And he tells people to uh, First Thessalonians, everybody who's single should uh, hold themselves in purity and cleanness. And if they can't, then they should marry. First Corinthians 7, the same thing. Uh, he advises celibacy, but he doesn't require it. And he goes back and forth, as you know, from First Corinthians 7. Uh, it seems like he's saying, okay, get married, but you don't need to, but it's okay, but I wish you wouldn't. But you know, he, uh, it's very clear at the end that he says, look, I wish everyone was like me, but uh, everybody's not. Now, what I would like to add there that's so important, I call it an apocalyptic celibacy. At least that's what he says. I know it can be read as, it's a celibacy that will allow you more time for devotion to the Lord, which he means Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, he does say that. But he also says that in view of the present distress, 
and the appointed time has grown very short. And those who have wives need to be as those who have none. And I saw somebody put in the chat uh, about fleeing on the Sabbath day, you know, in Mark 13, in the little synoptic apocalypse. And so clearly uh, this is part of the Jesus movement where whether Jesus said it or Mark said it, you know, the text we have is Mark 13. And Matthew, of course, repeating a version out of it, and Luke as well in Matthew 24, Luke 21, that, uh, you know, if you're pregnant or nursing in that time, that's it's going to be tough on you. So the, the implication there is not like marriage and pregnancy and nursing are bad, but maybe not the thing to buy into in, in the time of trouble. That seems to be the idea. And I also think Paul thinks that so many things, if you want to understand Paul, you have to understand that apocalyptic perspective. I really push it through both books, but particularly Paul and Jesus, because what it does is it changes the landscape for making your decisions. He, for example, does not think there will be male or female or marriage in the age to come. And Jesus also said the same thing in Mark repeated by Matthew, expanded even by Luke, that in the age to come, the age of the resurrection, we're not going to be gendered beings. And you're not going to be Jew or Greek. You're not going to be rich or poor. You're not going to be male or female. That's what he says in Galatians. So in Christ, you're already participating in this transformation to the new age. The problem comes when the new age doesn't come for 2,000 years, and here we are today, and people want to follow Paul, and they might, I mean, I know I have some of my students, very dedicated Christians, uh, very few, but a few, it's not a popular stance, that have been part of some uh, very evangelical religious groups that are citing not to get married, but to go do mission work or something like that. And they use Paul, you know, that I just want to dedicate myself to serving the Lord and so forth. And I'm sure many of them believe that there's not a lot of time left. But how do you spread that over 2,000 years? The groups that have advocated celibacy for the whole group, I think the Shakers are part of that, right? I believe they don't have marriage and children. Uh, you know, you're not long for this world. Now, they might take in other children and so forth. Like Josephus says, the Essenes do. You know, he tries to kind of make them celibate. I'm not sure he's correct on that. But that that's a huge thing because uh, what are you going to do then in the modern world when you might not live to see the end of the age? Whereas in those texts, I think the implication of the authors is you're, you're probably going to live to see it, you know. Now, as you know, with apocalypticism, it either fail miserably or you go to some preterist position, which I've noticed is more and more popular among certain evangelical Christians. And they go, well, it, it was all fulfilled, but not literally, you know, in 70 AD. Uh, and I guess what I always want to ask them so, is like, so there's no male or female now? And, <laughs> you know, it, it's not so easy to hold that position. And certainly Paul, when he talks about the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, he says, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will do this and do that. He's clearly expecting it to come in his day. And I don't see him allegorizing that. And of course, he's before 70 when he writes this. But, uh, you know, uh, the problem, I'm, I'm not in, and interested in refuting preterism or so-called full preterist position. And I think they claim that all prophecies are fulfilled. Every prophecy in the Hebrew Bible is totally fulfilled. So if you say, wait, are the nations coming up to Jerusalem and learning the Torah? Yeah, yeah, they're learning it through Christ. It's going to all the world. And Jerusalem is now Jerusalem above and, you know, there's a way to do this, so-called spiritualizing and allegorizing. My question is, is that what Paul meant when he wrote? Is that what he meant? Or did he think this would be what I call a video 
tapable event where Christ will appear in the clouds of heaven, the dead will rise, the living will rise, meet the Lord in the air, and undergo this transformation and so forth. I think he thinks that that's going to happen in a very, quote, literal, concrete way, and he expects to live to see it. And toward the end of his life, maybe in Philippians, certainly into the secondary Paul letters, he starts wondering if he might die before that happens. So, so I went on and on on that. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's 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 great. Um, we have a question. I think that kind of goes along with uh, what Paul is saying there in Galatians five, talking about uh, freedom. I believe it is. Let us stand, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Uh, that that leads me uh, to ask, like, here's a, uh, let me just ask this kind of blatantly. Do you believe that Paul contradicted Jesus in the, in the, uh, in the matter of eating meat sacrificed to idols? Well, I don't know that Jesus ever addresses it, really, does he? I'm, refer I'm I'm thinking like in Revelation chapters two and three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. by that time, if that is Jesus, the historical Jesus. Now, I do think Jesus would have never participated in that, even the historical Jesus. But, um, well, I think Paul would do just what he says, that if you understand that an idol is nothing and he calls you... He says, if you, a man of knowledge, understands this, then it seems to be there's no harm. But if it's going to cause one of your brothers or sisters to stumble, is the term he uses, to be offended, or maybe in a weak, he calls it a weak conscience, to also participate in that, when they would not have your understanding, uh, then he's against it. But... He also says, if you take 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 together, it, it actually breaks into two parts. He seems to, my view is that he gives a kind of liberal advice and then he has to back up. Because the Corinthians will go well with it if you let them. You're like, oh yeah, you could eat it. And then he goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. I did not mean that you should sit in an idol's temple. And then he says that they're demons in the idol's temple. And I don't want you eating at the table. You know, like in the temple, you're sitting at the table and they've just worshiped Athena and then they're bringing the food and maybe doing different kinds of ceremonies. No, do not do that. And he does say uh, idols are nothing, but there are forces and powers behind these religions of the greco roman world that are not the one true God but they are forces, and you don't want to have anything to do with that. The real uh, challenge is to know what he means in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, a chapter earlier, when he says, to the Jews I became as a Jew. Well, then he would not do any of that sort of thing, not even get close to it. But to those who are without the Torah, literally, I became as one outside the Torah, not being outside the Torah to God, but under the Torah of Christ, he says. <clears throat> and I think he means that there is a fundamental ideal that he thinks God and Christ, Jesus, would require for all humanity. <clears throat> so he doesn't mean he would, you know, violate the Torah in some blatant way that uh, clearly would be forbidden in the Remember, the Torah doesn't just address Jews. It also addresses non-Jews. And many principles of Torah would apply to the whole world by definition, like tripping a blind person or shouting at a deaf person and belittling them or letting your ox go into the property of another and do damage. These are just basic principles of justice and jurisprudence. And clearly, so this thing about the Torah for Paul, it's like this package deal. In Galatians, he doesn't want people, I just like the term today that we still use, convert to Judaism. <clears throat> and let's add convert to Orthodox Judaism. Okay. By Orthodox, meaning 
you're going to take on the obligation, the yoke, to keep all the commandments of the Torah as an Israelite or as a Jew. And in the ceremony inducting you, you become, even as a Gentile, part of the house of Israel. Nothing about lost tribes or anything, just a real Gentile that has no, it, it, it's not, it, that would be a different question. And he would say that uh, if you do that, then you're, on, he says in Galatians, you're under obligation to keep the whole Torah. You know that, you know, don't just think you'll go part with it. I think I'll be circumcised and I won't do this or I will do that. He goes, no, you, you got to do it all. So he's very upset that his opponents that are running around the Mediterranean world in the areas he works in are telling apparently Gentiles the opposite of what he thought was the agreement in the book of Galatians and what is echoed in Acts 15. Um, unfortunately, if you mix Acts in the book of Acts, it's a problem. I mean, you got to deal with the challenge of that. Is Acts 15 what really is what Galatians really says? Or does James basically say in Galatians and Peter and John, those in ahead of the Jerusalem church, we shouldn't even call it the church. James calls it in his book, the synagogue, the Jerusalem synagogue. It's a synagogue. It's the Nazarene synagogue in Jerusalem might have cell groups, but it's essentially the Nazarene synagogue. And he essentially says uh, that in terms of the Nazarene synagogue, we're, we're Jews and we're keeping the Torah. I don't think he's forbidding Gentiles to occupy the place of a god fear. Every synagogue we know in the Roman world allowed non-Jews to come today. I often attend Orthodox synagogues. I'm not Jewish. I can go in, I can be part of that. And when I'm in Israel, particularly meeting with rabbis, I, I take the role of, of what they would understand as a, a children of Noah. That's not my personal identity because I'm a scholar and academic, but you know, in order to work with them and uh, have them have some framework for saying, uh, who are you and what are you doing here visiting? I'm mainly there to listen to Hebrew and learn more from the rabbis and educate myself in Judaism. So it's something like that. And I get the idea that Paul thinks in Galatians that I was given the right hand of fellowship. And so my people that come to believe in the one God, they turn from idols. They believe Jesus is the Messiah raised from the dead, coming again at his parousia, his appearance. They do not have to become Jews. And I think that's what he means by those without the Torah. Now, remember in Romans 2, he doesn't think those outside the Torah are immoral, or he says they have a Torah written in their hearts. And this is sort of the universal Torah means teaching of God for all humankind. And he, he basically believes that his followers would find a welcome place under that kind of uh, arrangement. And I think he, just like rabbis today that I deal with, uh, they wouldn't care if I, as a non-Jew, decided not to eat pork or shrimp or shellfish. That wouldn't bother, or any unclean meat. They wouldn't they would probably feel that that maybe even was a good step. Maybe some of them might have health reasons. Uh, who knows? But it's sort of a solidarity. Uh, who knows if, it's that's, if that's how they would look at it. So um, I think Paul is working with that. But he's very clear. Don't think that means you can, live, you can worship idols or be sexy or moral or be a robber, or a thief, or a blasphemer. And he also has very high standards uh, for practicing love. Everybody knows, 1 Corinthians 13. That's about as high as you get. You know, husbands and wives often read it at a wedding. Everybody should read it. It's, it's probably Paul's greatest chapter. And he essentially says, what is agape love? 
is extended to other people. And that's a very high standard. It has nothing to do with like ticking off. Oh, did you do this law? Did you do this law? Did you do this law? The other thing today that's very different is of the 613 mitzvot in the Torah, according to the rabbis, say Maimonides, he makes a list and others, uh, three quarters of them don't even apply to the individual anyway. So if I did convert to Judaism, which I'm not planning to do, but if I did, I probably wouldn't change my lifestyle hardly at all, except there is oral tradition that I would then have to follow if I did the Orthodox. Now, if I went with the Karaites, I wouldn't really have to do any of that. You know, that's a form of Judaism that is getting more accepted. And they would say, no, if it's not written in the Torah, you, you know, you don't have to follow like washing of hands before a meal. That comes up in Mark 7, by the way. And I want to add about Mark 7 because everybody misreads this. And I mentioned it in my Mark course that we recorded this past week with Derek Lambert. Um, it does not say, thus he declared all foods clean. That is not in the Greek. It's actually a kind of a, almost like humor. What he's saying is, if you're worried about what goes into your mouth, you're worried about the wrong thing. Why? Because anything that goes into your mouth, let's say you did touch a Gentile in the marketplace. We're not talking about soap and water. We're talking about ritual purity. And the Pharisees had made their table like a temple. So now you're going to the temple, meaning the table, and you need to symbolically, I've been in Jewish homes many times on Shabbat, you pour the water over your hands three times and then you can eat the meal. Well, as a Gentile, I would do that too, just out of respect. And no rabbis ever told me, no, no, you don't need to do that. Um, but I wouldn't pick up their wine and open it for them. That would be against their tradition. So anyway, what he says is, uh, it's what goes in. He, he names 13 things that defile the heart. It's a nice list, actually, Mark 7. It might be as close as we get to the overall, you know, deep ethics of Jesus. And you take a look at it, it covers just about everything. You know, it's sort of like the internal ethics that would make a good human being. And it's similar to Paul's fruit of the spirit, works of the flesh in Galatians 5. And so what Mark says then is the disciples don't understand. They go, well, what do you mean? Like, like you said, it doesn't matter. And he goes, look, here's a biology lesson. Let's say you don't wash your hands. We haven't been following that. That's a tradition of the Pharisees. It's not our tradition as a Messianic group. Uh, what happens if you did get some Gentile defilement or some defilement from the marketplace? It goes into the toilet. That's what he says. It actually says in Greek, it goes into the drain Cleansing all foods. Now that thus he declared all foods clean, that's not in the Greek. It's a phrase. As it's going to go into the toilet and whatever contamination you were worried about, it's flushed away. It's nothing to do with anything spiritual. So that's Mark 7. And everybody misreads it. Oh, Jesus said we could eat shrimp. <laughs> and uh, I don't think Jesus, my view of Jesus would be he followed the Torah. And, and I think Paul probably followed the Torah, but I wonder if he did all the time, if, especially on some of these ritual requirements, if he was around very strictly observant Jews, because he says, if I'm around Jews, I, I quote, become as a Jew. Well, what do you mean, Paul? You become as a Jew. You are a Jew. But he says, I become as a Jew, as to, if they're under the law. But remember, he thinks that the what he calls the essence of the law, the Torah, law is a bad word. The essence of the teaching of God, the God of Israel, through Moses and the prophets, is uh, basically the heart. And he says the Gentiles who don't even know God, they have the Torah written in their heart, either accusing or excusing them on the day of judgment. And so he, he believes that there's a universal Torah for all humans, especially when it comes 
you know, like if you trip a blind person, I don't care if you're a Jew or not a Jew, who would not say that is just so horrible? And if you skimmed, if you extend that to so-called challenged, handicapped, whatever the term you want to use, people with disabilities in general, the principle applies universally. And any of us who care about other people are not going to want to see somebody who's limited in their abilities and have disabilities mistreated in any way, given those liabilities. And we would absolutely get angry about it, I think, and say, how could you even think of doing such a thing? Well, I'm not under the law. Where does it say, you know, seven laws? And no, I don't mention that. I remember years ago, I was at a rabbinic conference, and they were talking about the laws of no and so forth. So I stood up, and I, they said, any questions? I stood up. Professor Tabor, UNC Charlotte, I just had a question. If you can find the Torah for Gentiles to these seven laws, aren't you being, you're hitting parameters for sure. Like don't steal, don't lie, don't be sexually immoral, don't worship idols and so forth. But aren't you leaving out a lot of basic principles that every decent society would acknowledge? And I, I use that. I said, for example, the Torah says, don't trip a blind person and don't curse a deaf person. If they can't hear you, don't say what the blank, blank, blank is wrong with you. Can't, you know, and make them, you know, <laughs> and they said, well, that would be covered. And I, I felt like they almost need to add, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And actually, did you know, and remember the seven laws of Noah that the rabbis talk about, those are in a certain tractate of the Talmud where they're enumerated and talked about. But there are other traditions that include things like one of them is love your neighbor as yourself. And that would cover all the stuff that we're talking about. And Paul quotes that, right? Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, these are the great commandments. And against these, there's no law. You know, you don't, you don't need a law to say, oh, that's wrong. You know it's wrong. How do you know it's wrong? Because you need to treat people decently. And we all know what that is. Why? Because when we're shunned or hurt or harmed in any way, it stings like crazy. And we, we feel it and we know it, you know, and it hurts. So don't ever do that to somebody. So you're going to get a lot of law without going into the written traditions of Pharisaic Judaism, which he comes out of. When you're talking about First uh, Corinthians, when Paul said, "I became a Jew," I'm become like a Jew to the Jew, and those without the law to those who are without the law. Um, I like your take on that compared to Galatians two, when it it seems like I know some people say that he, you know, when he's talking about Paul, um, did Paul is he saying that he he does the thing the same things that what Paul did? What's your take on that? I mean, Peter, excuse me. I think Peter and James and John are fully observant according to the Nazarene traditions, which we don't have a good handle on. They're not Pharisees, and Jesus is not a Pharisee. And he always already says in our Gospels, Mark 7, I mentioned that the minhag, the traditions of the elders, end up violating a lot of the commandments and he apparently ran into trouble with them all the time. Uh, but so I would say that uh, James and Peter and John and the others in Jerusalem would have kept the Sabbath and the dietary laws and the festivals and the calendar and all these marks of Judaism, certainly circumcision for males and uh, I don't think that they would have gone outside of their tradition. Now, remember, maybe they were more uh, akin to what we know today as Karaites in that they did not think that there were two Torahs, you know, the Torah from Sinai and then the Torah from the elders that's passed on, which is part and parcel of so-called Orthodox Judaism today. 
if you go to a rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, and say, I'd like to convert, but I don't plan to keep any of the oral traditions of the Mishnah and the Talmud. If it's not in the Bible, I don't, I don't want it. They would say, go, go, to, go to a reform or conservative synagogue. And then you, who I think they would kind of reprimand you, who think you're so wise that you can pick and choose what it means to keep the Sabbath when we have spent 2,000 years trying to define that and you think you can do this and you can do that, then don't come to us because we're wanting people to follow the oral Torah as well as the written. Uh, and if you don't do that, you're not, quote, a faithful Jew, as we understand Judaism. Now, it doesn't mean you're not a Jew. If you're a Jew, you're a Jew. But the question is, how observant are you, first, of the Torah itself, and secondly, of the oral Torah, the Torah be'al pay from the mouth, the oral Torah that's taught. Uh, my guess is they have developed their own, what we call halakha. We know the Dead Sea Scroll group also uh, had a halakha or an interpretation of Torah observance. It actually seems to be stricter than the Pharisees. Everybody thinks the Pharisees are the strictest. Sadducees are much stricter, and certainly the so-called Essenes are much stricter. My favorite example is uh, if an animal falls in a pit on Shabbat, uh, can you help it out? And the Qumran group goes, absolutely not. And they don't even have you go to the toilet on Shabbat. You have to hold it for 24 hours. Now, we think maybe urination was allowed in a private place, but definitely not leaving the camp and going out to the latrines that they had. Not allowed to do that. I've written on that. I've got a YouTube video because I found the latrines uh, at Qumran. I was able to identify them scientifically by, by uh, digging the remains of the human waste and analyzing it and so forth. But um, I think... Basically, it just it just depends on um, what their we call halakha would have been for the Nazarenes, and given our gospels, it seems to be flexible on some of these things that the other groups would be strict on, but not to the point of just disregarding. So, like I said earlier, uh, I seriously doubt if James, Peter, John, any of the apostles ever ate pork. And uh, I'm sure they didn't eat meat offered to idols. They didn't eat blood. If they ate meat, it would be kosher. According to our tradition, James is a vegetarian. I'm vegan, so I get out of all the trouble when I'm in Israel because there's nothing that I eat that would be uh, non-kosher. You know, carrots and vegetables and salads. It's one of the joys of being in Israel. They have these wonderful spreads of healthy organic food. And if you go to a meat place uh, or a dairy place, they're going to have the meat and the dairy. But if you go to a non-meat and dairy place, nothing you want. You order the soup, you have to say, did you put beef broth, even though beef's okay? Do you put beef broth in the soup? They go, you see this sign? We're a vegetarian restaurant. We don't have any animal products whatsoever. So Israel's my place for that because I have hundreds of restaurants on every corner that I can eat at without even worrying about it. And my reasons have nothing to do with the Torah or religion, although my own religion, they have to do with ethics and health that I, uh, for many years now, have wanted to live the kind of vegetarian vegan life and for me it's been tremendously uh, good for me i'm not going to brag about my health but i'm very pleased at my age with the energy i have and everything else but it's mainly ethics i i really object to the way uh, domestic animals pigs goats chickens and cows are are marketed and handled in our culture Including culture, including kosher, because koshers have huge slaughterhouses and 
they try to say, oh, yeah, but the animals don't even feel anything. And, you know, it's all wonderful. Well, there's been ex exposés of that. Uh, you can't kill a big animal like that with quite a bit, without quite a bit of, uh, let's just say, violence, you know. And the next one in line senses that and begins going crazy because they smell the blood, they hear it, they get the adrenaline, you know. So not to get on that, but uh, uh, Swartz, Rabbi Swartz has a book called Jewish Vegetarianism where he, I think he might even be observant, you know, like an observant Jew, but he uh, he tries to show that that to follow the ideal is ideal because then you don't have to worry about that. It's kind of like the Genesis thing where I've given you every green herb and every plant and every tree bearing fruit, nothing about shedding blood. So um, John the baptizer, we think uh, James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, I don't know about, we don't have enough about him, but I would say that they're following um, some fairly strict form of Torah observance. I mean, they had to have some tradition. Like, what do you do on Shabbat? You know, what what is it? Uh, what does it involve? What can you do? What can't you do? But whether they went with the full Pharisaic interpretation that develops later in what we see in the Mishnah, Tractate Shabbat, I have no idea. I would think things are getting stricter as time goes on, but, you know, I don't know. So do you think that Paul was a little bit hypocritical with Peter? I know some people believe this, you know, when he rebuked Peter for Judaizing or for being like a Jew with the Jews and like a Gentile with the Gentiles. And, you know, you mentioned what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, where he seems to say something similar to that. Do you think he's being a little bit hypocritical there? Um. Well, Galatians is a really good source, and of course, it's after the conference that they have. It's later at Antioch, and what he's condemning is what he sees as some hypocrisy that's going on, where apparently it has to do with table fellowship. It wouldn't mean that Peter's saying, uh, oh, hand me one of your ham sandwiches, you know, I'm free in Christ, you know, it wouldn't have to mean that. I don't think it means that. I think Peter is living according to the Torah, most likely. Uh, that was the idea. I will go to the Jews that was made. And Paul said, well, I'll go to the Gentiles. And we agree that they don't have to convert to Judaism and take on the whole yoke. And so what he's condemning is that when James comes, or people from James, rather, to visit Antioch, check things out, you picture a cafeteria, Peter's like, Who's here? Oh, I'm going to take my tray, if you don't mind, and move over with the Jews. Now, it doesn't mean on his tray was treif. You know, he might have brought his own lunch or whatever, but he doesn't even want to be, you know, because there's all kinds of ritual things that could be involved, like is he going to drink the wine? Where did the wine come from? That kind of thing. And Corinth is a wild place. And, and Antioch is probably a pretty, by wild, I mean pretty mixed with lots of cultures and views. It's a very, very much of a center. It's uh, headquarters of, of Roman occupation up there in Antioch. Uh, so I think he's just saying, you know, you, you're a hypocrite because you, a Jew, live like a Gentile, meaning in this context, not like you're out you know, breaking all the laws of the Torah. But but then um, you obviously uh, won't stand up for that if somebody is going to criticize you from the more conservative wing. We certainly get the idea that James would not have uh, eaten with the Gentiles. That's the idea I get. Uh, mind you of segregation, you guys are separate but equal. You know, we're in a church, black and white, whatever, red and yellow. I don't care the color, race. We're all the same. But when we meet socially or whatever, you're well provided for be with your own kind. And we've got what we 
but we can sit together and worship. We're united. Uh, that's a bad analogy because you're jumping to modern, the modern world and all, but I think it was something like that, that uh, the cultures cannot just melt together. There's too many differences. And especially if they're meeting on Shabbat, which I think they are. Sunday's not coming down the pike for quite a while. And uh, they're keeping the Sabbath. And But how are they keeping the Sabbath? Uh, Paul says in Galatians 4 that people observe days, months, seasons, and years. And they're apparently getting into things like the calendar and maybe disputes about when does the Sabbath begin and when does it end and what are you allowed to do and so forth. And he does not want his followers to even enter that arena. But, and here we disagree with, I would disagree with many, many interpreters. I think Paul felt the Sabbath was a universal kind of thing for all humankind uh, based on the prophets, based on Genesis and so forth. He would read it very, you know, evangelically. I mean, he thinks it's the inspired word of God. And so he would uh, probably believe the Sabbath is uh, for everybody, but then the question is how. And in Romans 14, he talks about uh, observe, observing the day to the Lord and others consider every day alike. Remember, he thinks everything's going to pass away very quickly, very quickly. None of this will even exist. But in the meantime, he thinks it's better to go along with the cultural flow than to cause a problem. So if somebody says, I observe the Sabbath and you're with them on the Sabbath, you know, don't walk out and say, well, I'm going to light a cigarette and work on my car or something. You know, I'm just kidding, but you get the idea. You would have like a sense of uh, respect for them. You know, uh, I just think, I don't know what Paul would say if he could come back today and give him a little history lesson on the different groups. Well, I know he'd be horrified at what Christianity became. I'm absolutely sure of that. But I don't know what he would say about um, the everything's going to change very quickly, but it didn't. So what does that say about many of the things you recommended to people because you were doing it on the basis of... Uh, the appointed time of the end is very short. Clearly it wasn't. So what are we going to do? I think he would make the adjustment uh, probably if he didn't go crazy <laughs> knowing everything that went on in the name of Jesus, which would be pretty horrible. Uh, he his, his eyes would be as big as saucers even hearing any of it, you know, from Constantine all the way down. Uh, what? what Christians have done. So, you know, we got to leave him in the ancient world, got to leave him in his time. It's a real problem if you take that and move it 2,000 years, and then are women allowed to speak in the assembly? Uh, what about hairstyles? 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the old creation was Adam and Eve as a subordinate. But that's the old creation. He already thinks you're moving into the new creation. So maybe he's just trying to accommodate aspects of the Jewish culture that would be very strict. I personally think the covering is hair, but even if it was more of a Muslim Jewish kind of Orthodox covering, either a wig or a cloth or Roman Catholic women, I don't know if they still do it, but they would cover their head before going in the church. Whether that's true or not, I think um, he would have uh, tended to feel that for now, don't rock the boat. You know, you can get married. It's probably better not to even remember. He doesn't just talk about ethics. He says starting a business. He says the time has come where those who deal with the world. This is first Corinthians seven will no longer deal with it. So you say, well, I'm going to start an independent company and be an entrepreneur. And I'm going to have all my teeth fixed and I'm going to do this and that. Paul would probably say, you know, 
we might have less than a year to go, two years, three years at the most. Uh, maybe those things are not what you should focus on right now, because if you let all that go, even if you're a slave, you're going to be free so soon. And if you're a master, we'll treat your slaves decently as a Christian, you know, but he never tells them to free their slaves. You know, he says, are you a slave? Well, if you can get free, yeah, good. But, you know, even if you can't get free, well, you can't import that into the modern world and say we should have slaves. Remember the slave owners in the South, in else, actually, I shouldn't say in the South, in the North as well, who defended slavery in the 1850s and 60s. Paul was their favorite guy to quote. Hmm. If you're a slave, stay a slave. You're free in Christ. Well, that doesn't work when it's 2000, 1860 years later, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to work. So. so I think we have to always read Paul in the light of his times. I saw somebody said they're a big fan of John Dominic Crossan. I am as well. We disagree pretty strongly on the apocalyptic kind of thing. But Crossan really tries to pull from Paul some perennial political, social, and cultural messages that would really be relevant today, and they're very radical, and from Jesus, that actually would, uh, he thinks, destroy the Roman Empire once they were followed, and today could transform any culture into what was more just and righteous and good. So he's got this new book out. Um, I forgot the name of it, but it's about rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and so forth. And I like his work because I think uh, he would say that if you follow these things in their ideal, you will dismantle the principalities and powers. Now, of course, he is very liberal in that sense. I'm sure he doesn't believe in demons or any literal Satan or anything like that, but he would interpret the results as being the same, that the forces of power, wealth, privilege, oppression, injustice are operating full scale all over the world in every culture. And if we would take up the ideals pioneered by Jesus, by Paul, uh, we would the world would get transformed. But he would probably add, in the meantime, you're going to get smashed. <laughs> and that's called taking up the cross. It won't be popular. So, so the you forces believe that of Paul, evil are strong. Paul, um, Paul clearly said and taught that he, would, that he would live in the last, he would live basically to see the second coming and all that kind of thing. I think so. Yeah, yeah I, think I think so. this is something I said a couple of years ago on, uh, on, um, and posted it, and I got a lot of people. You get, you get a lot of people who say, you know, they believe that Paul is absolutely perfect in everything that he said. <laughs> what would you say to somebody like that? Well, it's just kind of ludicrous, really, when you think about it. Um, he's of his own time and place, and uh, they're probably talking about all of the 13 letters, maybe even the book of Hebrews thrown in, and they're trying to systematically build a theology from the whole Bible, probably everything but the Apocrypha for most of them, they'd throw that out, but Genesis to Revelation. And I mean, it just, uh, it's not my worldview. It can't be done. And I wouldn't want to do it. Uh, I think there's much more meaning, edification, inspiration in the books if we will read them as close as we can in their historical context. And then we will have something that we can actually apply to our lives. And I, I like to give you a new definition of liberal and conservative. I think the conservatives are liberal. And what I mean by liberal is conservative, meaning I'm being careful with the text and trying to understand it like we do have four Gospels, and they, they do contradict. So I'm being conservative because I want to try to get back to what might have been more authentic or original. If Matthew rewrites Mark, 
and goes in directions that Mark didn't go in, like picking grain on the Sabbath, Mark, compare Matthew 12, Mark 2. Very different approach. And they freely take out things, add things, and shape the whole pericope very differently. And yet, uh, to harmonize it, you just put it all together. And I tell my students all the time, if you want to harmonize the Gospels, you will destroy all the, all, all of the Gospels. They're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Say, no, no, I kept it all. No, you didn't. Okay, let's read Picking Grain on the Sabbath. What do you got now? Oh, well, I have a composite of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I put all three together. Oh, did you? Well, where's Mark then? Oh, it's in there. No, but I want to read Mark. Let's see what he says and then see how Matthew has edited that and added to it. And then Luke, his version, which is closer to Mark, by the way. For some of them take out the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which is a great principle in Mark. Laws are for people. People aren't for laws. That's going to get you a long way in terms of interpreting the Torah. But it's scary to rigid people because it sounds like situational ethics, which it is. Like, you know what Jesus says in Mark on your disciples are breaking the Sabbath, they're harvesting. And that's one of the 39 forbidden kinds of work in the, in the Torah. And he goes, yeah, okay, well, what did David do? He went into the tent of meeting and took the bread of the presence, which was unlawful. So he broke the law. And uh, so you say, I'm breaking the law. Okay, have it your way. He broke the law. I'll just be like David. I'll break the law. Now, this is all facetious. You see, it's all like he broke the law. And then he says, but if you knew what this meant, you know, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. Now, Matthew adds that. So he's kind of on the right track. But he says the reason that the disciples are okay for what they did is because Jesus said they could do it. And he says, why did David break the law? Well, it was uh, for the temple. Now, Jesus says, no, it was for human need. Human need, they were starving, they're going to faint. It wasn't for the temple. And so he, and then he says, but one greater than the temple is here. So if for the temple it was forbidden to eat the bread, and now Jesus says something, then he's just like a walking Torah. You go by what he says. So to me, that's that's taking, I'm using liberal as a worthless term because of politics, but you're taking liberties with the text rather than letting each text speak in its own context mm. and trying to understand it historically. Mm. And uh, harmonizing doesn't work. It doesn't work in the Hebrew Bible either. Uh, lots of Christians, former Christians, get disenfranchised with the New Testament. They're told by people, give it all up. It's a mess. It's all contradicting. And they go, go to the Torah. As if the Torah has no variance. I mean, I got my Hebrew Bible right here. Every, every page has about that many variants at the bottom. You say, yeah, but I just want to go by the Masoretic text. Oh, really? Okay. So you're stuck in the Leningrad Codex from the 11th century AD. What if I've got a copy from the 2nd century BC and it has differences? And what if I have the Septuagint that has differences? Well, you can see why people will go... I don't even want to know that. I don't even want to know that. You are going to so doubt, so discord, and, you know, just never want to listen to you again. But there are people that want to know. And actually the, and I'm not talking about JEPD and, you know, the Wellhausen hypothesis. I'm just saying there are voices in the Torah that Moses didn't write, of course, when it says things like, and this is done to this day, and that's not Moses writing that. That's an ed editorial comment and so forth. It's quite complex because it's the Pentateuch is a five different takes on it. But by going to the, quote, Torah and parading it around, you know, like, this is the Torah. I follow the Torah. You got to understand 
that you're still going to make these interpretations. And people who try that, in my experience, I know a lot of uh, Hebrew roots Christians that want to follow the Torah. They dispute over the calendar. They dispute over keeping the Sabbath. They usually have some charismatic leader that tries to tell them what to do. So in a sense, they set up their own sect, you know, with own, its, own, its own interpretations. And I guess I don't care about that unless you're rigidly deciding that if anybody doesn't go with your view, uh, God doesn't look at you or something. What about pronouncing the name? Oh, my God. <laughs> Why will these people like, if you say Yehovah, or Jehovah, or Yahweh, you know, some would say, God won't hear you. You're not calling his name right. Yeah. You know, and yet you call me James, and my name is Yaakov. Yeah. <laughs> or Jacob. <laughs> I happen to be speaking English. <laughs> but, you know, people have these ideas, uh, and I understand people. I mean, people are well motivated. I'm not hard on people, believe me. They're trying to do what they think God wants them to do. And some of the historical critical people are so out in left field, in my view, that they would basically say that nothing is really worthy of any kind of, uh, you know, inspiration or providential revelation or anything like that. I mean, uh, I don't tend to discuss my personal beliefs, um, uh, because I still see myself, even though I've retired, as having the mode of an academic professor that follows the history, historian of religions. That's my feel. Now, if I met with you privately somewhere and you start talking about what I believe, well, that would be our business if we want to delve into anything. But I want to represent a certain academic standard and I would like there to be a lot of latitude and grace about that where people aren't hitting each other over the head with this view and that view and segregating and dividing up. And no matter what you believe, that would violate everything Paul stood for, right? Because clearly that brother is like, or sister is a weak person to you. They don't see it like you. So you just let them have it. And finally, if they don't agree, you just tell them, well, you're not welcome to be with us then. And then you're talking about something approaching a sect or even cult. And I don't like the word cult because of the Waco aftermath. Uh, but let's use the term a high demand religion with a charismatic leader that enforces all his or her views. And frankly, it's usually his. Men do it more than women upon the flock and if you don't agree then my way or the highway and i think that's never helpful to me it, it's very distasteful and in my experience i have students that have gone down those routes and picked up on something they always want to well, dr Tabor, what do you think i say well let me expose you to more history and more ability to be critical with sources and texts, and then you're going to have to make your own judgment. Usually people don't last long in those kind of movements. The rigidness and often leaders end, end up being corrupt. And I don't need to tell you probably what the liabilities are, but my experience is sex, money, and power. Uh, gets about everybody that tries to set up some rigid thing and they will interpret it all and they're the leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Paul, of course, is used for that a lot. <laughs> so, Okay, so we went to 323. That's two hours. We're getting near. Yeah, any yeah, final? I, um, I have any. Uh, you know what? There is so much stuff uh so many more questions. So, hey, I mean, um, it would yeah, be why don't you back. assemble the questions? Maybe some of them repeat and we could do an advanced level of this. Uh, and we would let people know this. You should hear the first one first because Tabor is not going to repeat all the. Uh, in fact, we could have a session where you just ask 
uh, questions of your viewers. That would be fine with me. Sure. You know, and then if you or your own questions. Uh, yeah, I feel very comfortable talking to you. Uh, you guys are good listeners. And uh, yeah, I, I see somebody. I'm just looking here. Uh, the weightier matters of the law. Yeah, that's one of the great texts in the in the. Uh, that's actually in the Gospel of Matthew about you tithe mint, anise, and cumin, these little herbs, and yet you neglect, you know, mercy, justice, and love. Uh, so that's these great principles. Now, I want to say this about the rabbis. The great rabbis already make all these points. I'm talking about the great rabbis that I've read and studied and they might be pretty strict on halakhic observance if they're from the Pharisaic rabbinic tradition, but they totally understand about intentionality, the heart of a person. And the good ones are very compassionate toward non-Jews and really appreciate if somebody's trying to draw near to the God of Israel as they understand it. And so, uh, as you know, you're on YouTube, you get the nastiest stuff if you even say the word Jew, much less Judaism or anything. So much hatred out there, racism, uh, bigoted. I mean, I have to monitor comments every day. I have to look at every comment. And I let some of them through if they're not abusive. But it's not like I'm trying to keep people from expressing their views. But it's tough out there in uh, the social media world. We know that. And unfortunately, people leave all their ethics behind and all their love for other people and their kindness and their empathy and their understanding. And uh, I can tell by talking with you today and looking at the criticisms, uh, I mean, the, uh, the uh, input, I should say, from some of the chat. So, yeah, we can do it again. Give me a week or so into maybe into September. I need some time. Uh, got an anniversary coming up. We're going to go out of town for a while. I'm finishing a book. So, yeah, I'd be, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to have you back for sure. Well, I'm glad we worked it out, Christopher. I'm and, glad uh, too. And I'm, I'm glad that we got the uh, audio working. And yeah, yeah very good. It was, I appreciate your time. And, you know, I encourage everyone to. There are links in the description to, uh, to Professor Tabor's uh, websites, his academic blog, jamestabor.org, and his personal blog. Uh, YouTube has over 100 videos now, so if you want to, it's probably an overdose on Tabor, but, you know, you can take what you are able to stand, so lots well, of time. Yeah. I encourage everyone listening to go and subscribe to uh, um, Professor Tabor's YouTube channel. It's James Tabor Videos, is it? I think it is. Yeah, James Tabor Videos. Uh, I think that's the tag, but you can just put it in on a search for YouTube and it'll come up right away. James Tabor Videos. Yeah. And the link is in the description anyway. In the uh, yeah. yeah. So, I'm pretty easy to find out there. So <laughs> a lot of presence on the web. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Christopher. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And I want everybody, everyone in the chat to let uh, Professor Tabor how much, uh, know how much you appreciate uh, appreciate him coming on here and, uh, and uh, teaching us. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll do it again. Thank you. Okay, guys. Yes, please go to... Uh, um, Check out some of his books. Uh, I would highly encourage you, especially since we're talking about Paul. We, you know, he was talking about Paul and Jesus and uh, things unutterable and uh, Paul's as ascent to paradise. So, uh, yeah, um, amazing, amazing uh, stuff. Yeah. So, um, Abril says, uh, thank you, Professor. It gave me a new perspective. Awesome. Abro says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Abro. Good to see you. Um, Tammy says, thank you so much. Uh, Billy says, thank you all. Great show. Thank you very much. 
and seek the Lord, says uh, Dr. Tabor, thoroughly enjoyed this teaching. All right. Vinny says, thank you, Dr. James Tabor. That was awesome. Shalom. Calamento says, thank you, Professor James Tabor. Hope to see you soon. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it was awesome. Absolutely awesome. Uh, I'm going to have to watch the, I'm going to have to study the replays myself to make sure I get every, every, uh, every, every bit that was, that, uh, that was taught and shared here. Um, as I said, there's so much more. I know, we, I know you guys know there's so much more we can talk about. So Lord willing, we will have Professor Tabor back, uh, as he said, probably later in September. So yes, I'm looking forward to that. It was a great blessing and an honor and a privilege to have Professor Tabor with us. Abro said, yeah, we hope to have you back, Professor Tabor, really soon. Uh, Ezekiel said, thank, thank you, Professor James. All right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so normally I have a live stream on Sunday evening. I think tonight I'm not going to do that. Uh, we have a lot. We... We've been uh, we've been here for over a couple hours now, and uh, yeah, um, I think what I'll do is I'll pick up uh, with uh, with uh, my normal I guess we could say normal uh, sc sc normally scheduled live streams tomorrow evening at seven p.m. Eastern. So for the, any of you who are watching, if you're not subscribed, um, if you haven't liked, make sure you leave a like and make sure you subscribe, um, and. Uh, and let everyone know to watch the replay and that, uh, Lord willing, he will be back. Uh, Tammy said, what a great guy. So down to earth. Yes, please have him back. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. Okay, guys. Yes. And, the, you know, um, I also, too, just want to remind you guys uh, to, uh, as uh, Professor Tabor said, uh, you know, earlier on, to put your name in his... Um, uh, email list from his, uh, if you go to his blog, uh, jamestabor.com, um, you can, you can, uh, subscribe to his email. All right. So just so you guys know here, we have, uh, jamestabor.com. Okay. And if you're on a, uh, computer, as he was sharing, it's on the right hand side. So it's right here. Subscribe to blog via email, and you, you heard you heard him say himself he he respects your privacy, and he he will not share your email with anybody. He, you know, so please uh, go there. Let him know that you uh, you know. Let him know how much you appreciate him, and subscribe to his email, and uh, and yeah. So that was amazing, absolutely amazing. So as always, um, thank you everyone for, for coming today, for listening, for um, submitting your questions and your comments. I appreciate every one of you. And uh, you guys are awesome. You guys are world changers, as I always say. So I'll see you again tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Tammy says right here, I'm signed all he has available. <laughs> yeah, every one of you, please go and sign up and, uh, and, and get... Um, Get, get blessed, get blessed. All right, so amazing. I'll talk to you guys again tomorrow at 7 p.m. As always, as I always say, uh, I pray one of you and that the Lord will bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen. See you guys tomorrow night.